So within each discipline of security, whether that be information security, cybersecurity, etc., we have to have security controls because we can't secure anything if we don't have any measure of control. And those are just generally referred to as security controls or controls. So within that, there are three main uh, categories of security controls, preventative, detective, and corrective. So preventative controls are designed to prevent an incident from ever occurring. So having antivirus installed on a computer will help deter the likelihood that malware will get on the computer and successfully execute and run, comp and, you know, stops it from compromising that machine. So that's a preventative control. A detective control might be controls designed to identify an alert. An intrusion detection system on the network would help detect and alert us to anomalous or mal mal known malicious network activity. And then we have corrective controls, controls that limit uh, the extent of damage or scope of an incident. So within, again, uh, network devices, we have access control lists and firewall rules. We can use these corrective controls to limit the scope of a breach or the, the reach of an adversary or the fallout from uh, malicious activity in the network. Within those three general types, we then have uh, some unique security control types. So we can have physical controls, technical controls, procedural, and legal or regulatory controls. So physical controls are controls that restrict physical access. So those are quite easy to grasp, doors, locks, and even fencing. Technical controls can be uh, software, hardware. I mentioned a few intrusion detection systems, uh, antivirus. Those are examples of technical controls. Procedural controls, controls that manage a process. So hiring, we do background investigations. We review a candidate. Uh, we do all of the necessary paperwork to clear somebody for access to our data systems and physical workplace. That's a procedural control to not let the wrong individual in that could cause harm. And then again, we have legal and regulatory controls, these most scary controls. These are controls uh, that are based on law or policies within the organization and, and sometimes st uh, state, federal, and even local uh, laws and regulations dictating how an organization will conduct itself how we will protect data, how we will do those uh, uh, background investigations on individuals. So all of these control types working in concert provide many different methods to mitigate a perceived risk and achieve a level of security that, you know, of course, again, is unique to the organization and their perception of what is secure. So let's quickly talk about some physical security controls. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with badges, access cards, doors and locks. Don't really need to go too much into there. Cameras and motion sensors, we see a lot of those around buildings and access, looking, uh, recording, people moving about the premises, and uh, you know that really deters honest people. Um, uh, if somebody wants to get in, a camera's not going to deter them. A man trap is a a uh, piece of hardware that you physically walk in that restricts um, the ability for more than one person to walk into a room. Um, so if you had a secure facility and you were worried about you know, somebody opening a door with their key card and then people walking in the door behind them, you would use a man trap. And essentially it only allows one person to enter uh, through that entryway one at a time. Uh, in the government where I used to work, we had man traps that would measure your weight in the morning and in the evening when you left. And if there was a variation of too much weight, it would physically lock you in the box and it would stop you from leaving so that security could uh, ask you why you are so much more. And I think it was roughly like 10 or 15 pounds. But essentially they're looking for, you know, hey, why do you have a backpack full of you know, tons of paper and documents or what have you. Um, and that's really what those, those types of, of devices uh, provide. Uh, bollards, uh, we've all seen bollards. They're physical barriers in front of buildings. Uh, if you go to a retail store and the concrete uh, balls, like say in front of Target, the big red balls they have out there, essentially stop vehicles and large uh, uh, objects from moving on to walkways and paths. They restrict a vehicle from driving in a front door, if you will. Uh, landscaping, a lot of people don't think of landscaping as a physical security control, but it definitely is. 
Uh, if you notice uh, in some government organizations or you look at military bases and stuff like that, they'll usually have a fence and there's usually a lot of wide open field and the fields are there to provide a clear view. Uh, if somebody gets over the fence that they have to make their way across that field. And then there's usually bushes and trees and a lot of shrubbery around buildings because it makes it harder for people to try to get through that in through a window, what have you. So there's a lot of ways that landscaping is designed and deployed that restricts human movement uh, so that it's easier to detect and, and spot people uh, being where they shouldn't be. Fencing lighting, I think that goes without saying, you know, restricting lighting dark areas so we can see, you know, a potential threat. Um, and of course, uh, security guards are ever vigilant security guards watching uh, the premises. Let's look at some information security controls. So data classification is huge. Uh, coming from classified government spaces, data classification was a part of my everyday life. Uh, unclassified for official use only, secret, top secret, and various uh, control markings that would be applied to those security uh, data classifications um, helped us identify how we should handle and treat that information. Top secret information is uh, treated with higher respect and care than secret to a large degree. And secret, of course, is cared with a greater degree of concern and, and control than that of unclassified information. Uh, so data classification is very important for the organization, not only to uh, ensure that data isn't uh, leaked unnecessarily, but the act of doing data classification uh, implies that the organization has done the process of even identifying what data is important. Many, many organizations have not done data classification in their organization and would struggle to identify which systems store critical information that could not be lost and that would be detrimental to the organization. So data classification, very, very important, and it falls within information security. We have authentication and authorization. Who has access and what do they have access to? And that makes that whole activity way easier when you've done data classification. If you know where your data is and you know how it's classified, it's much easier to authenticate and authorize individuals to view and use that information. To add additional security, data encryption, encrypting that data so that only authenticated and authorized users have access to that data. If an unauthenticated or non-authorized individual gains access to data through some means, it's encrypted and in theory would be nearly impossible for that individual to break open or crack and view the clear text or original content uh, prior to encryption. Uh, communication encryption, simply encryption on data at, at in transit, whereas data encryption is encryption at rest. So the exact same reasons we would encrypt data, but data as it's moving. And again, last but not least, backing up data. We talked previously about ransomware being a threat to organizations. If you're not backing up your data and you're hit with ransomware, how do you recover your data if you, you know, don't want to pay the ransom? If you don't have data backups and you can't lose the data, unfortunately, you might have to pay. And I don't condone paying for ransomware. I highly suggest people have data backups and they encrypt their data and they have good authentication and authorization to limit the damage that ransomware and other attacks could uh, put against the organization. So let's review some cybersecurity controls. We've talked about a few of these, but antivirus, one that almost everybody should be familiar with, is designed to stop viruses and malware from executing on our computers. Network segmentation is really important because it restricts how uh, an adversary can move around the network. This is also referred to as lateral movement. When attacker compromises a network, they need to move from computer to computer looking for credentials that give them a higher level of access. And not before long, if there's no network segmentation, they will find those machines, compromise them, and find the credentials that are needed to essentially gain the keys to the kingdom. So network segmentation is the uh, controls that are put in place that restrict the ability for any one computer to talk or to communicate with other machines that it doesn't have a business need to do so. So an example of being the HR computers do not need to talk to the R&D server. 
There's no need for that to ever occur. So why would our network support that communication channel? If we block it, we've now secured our network from those HR machines being compromised and then attacking or going after our R&D intellectual property. Network security monitoring is a follow-up to network segmentation. Once we have good network segmentation, it's very easy to baseline and identify what's going on in our network. So through good monitoring, we can start to identify these known and unknown threats to our organization. To further support uh, our cybersecurity controls, we harden systems, which simply means we reduce the attack surface. A good way to think of that is a default Linux operating system, say from Ubuntu, comes with a certain set of features that are enabled by default. Well, we don't need all of those features and leaving them on by default exposes us to potential compromise. What if one of those features that we're not using becomes vulnerable? An exploit is identified for it. We have it running, even though we don't use it, it is now a risk to our operations. So by reducing or limiting what is running on a workstation or how it is configured reduces our attack surface and again, hardens the system from attack within the network. To further support system hardening, vulnerability and patch management, identifying vulnerabilities and patching them, updating the software, keeping things to the latest version is critical to securing a network. For the most part, vulnerability and patch management and strong policy regarding uh, the use of passwords and how passwords are audited would probably stop well into the 90th percentile of attacks that most organizations occur. There's generally a few uh, basic principles of security that when applied are extremely effective. The problem is it's just easier said than done. Even though they're simple tasks, it's hard to do at scale. And again, logging and auditing. Data is cheap, storage is cheap, communication uh, bandwidth is cheap. Log and store everything for analysis. The more data you have, the better insights you have into what's normal so that you can identify what's anomalous or known to be malicious. And that really supports your investigation process. I've been asked to go do forensic activities where no data was stored, there's no logging, there's no records of anything occurring, and the activity occurred that they believe was malicious over a month ago. There's really not much that can be done in that instance when there's no external logging or information about what occurred and the activity happened so long ago. Uh, a lot of forensic data has a short uh, time to live, has a short shelf life. So unless you get in there right after the perceived uh, attack occurred, uh, you're not going to get a whole lot. And if there's no supporting network security monitoring logs, there's no auditing and logging uh, of systems and communications in the network, there's a whole lot uh, we really can't do to support that uh, problem. So operational security controls. Uh, this is a simple one. Don't overshare. Don't gossip. Keeping information uh, regarding security activities, operations, and the capabilities of what's going on uh, within the the group who has a need to know is absolutely critical. We don't want to overshare what we're doing and what's going on. A big part of what security operations teams deal with is HR issues. So think of uh, an employee who's might be looking at pornographic material and they somebody in the security team needs to monitor that user, unfortunately, to build a case for uh, reprimand or termination. Um, so we certainly don't want to overshare and talk about that case because there might be legal ramifications. Um, and in many cases, some cyber investigations do go to court. Um, and you certainly don't want to be the person who uh, caused a court case to have no merit because you overshared or leaked information uh, inappropriately. Uh, using virtual machines, the virtualization of operating system has been a huge boon to our ability to analyze information, uh, particularly malicious software malware in a safe environment. So we're able to collect malware and detonate or execute it in this safe virtual environment for analysis. And this allows us to do investigatory activities uh, in a secure place that doesn't leak out to the rest of the network and doesn't tip off adversaries that were analyzing their tools and capabilities. Uh, virtual private networks or proxies 
are important so as to provide a level of anonymity when we're doing our research online. Uh, when you're doing an investigation that requires open source research, you're looking up IP addresses, network information, things that are available online in a great, uh, a great many places. Um, it's possible that in your searching online, you might tip off an adversary that you're trying to do research about them. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So anonymizing yourself online is very important so as not to tip off the adversary. Uh, another tool that a lot of organizations use is a LTE hotspot or just a, a mobile hotspot. Uh, when you're dealing with a serious uh, uh, breach or infection in the network, they don't even trust their local network anymore to communicate. They'll go you use LTE, LTE hotspots to remove the communications and the coordination of the investigation completely outside of the network using different communication channels. Again, that goes into secure communications. Many advanced uh, attackers, when they compromise a the network, they're going to go monitor the security team and admins of that network. If you're an adversary and you have access to the network, why wouldn't you go get on the mail server and monitor the email communications of the network admins and what they're talking about? Oh, are they talking about, you know, uh, something going on weird and anomaly on one of those servers? Hey, you know, one of our pieces of malware is on that computer. Let's remove that malware before they investigate it so they don't detect us, right? So it's very important that as defenders, we use secure communications uh, when we think something's going on to us not to tip off our adversary about our, our uh, operational practices and what we're doing. Uh, data sharing controls. Uh, this is really important and it goes back to data classification in many ways. Um, when you working are working in a security operations team, uh, not only are you receiving an influx of information about what your network's doing and you know what the industry is seeing from trends and alerts and, and, and types of different malicious activities, your organization will generate its own threat intelligence or information or knowledge about what's been going on in your network, the types of attacks and activity you've been seeing. Many organizations share this information with other organizations. Um, there's data sharing between um, uh, many different online retailers, Amazon, Walmart, Kmart, Target, all these organizations. While they might hate their guts publicly, they do have a shared responsibility and a shared risk uh, to, uh, to mitigate because they all operate in the same space. They're all competitors to one another but they're all susceptible to the same types of attacks. So it's in their best interest to share information between them. So with that sharing of information, we've got to have good data sharing controls to ensure that we're not oversharing information or information that shouldn't have gotten out uh, did or did not get out. So in summary, there are multiple disciplines of security. Information security is not cybersecurity, and conversely, cybersecurity is not information security. IT security is essentially the operational uh, cohesiveness of all of these disciplines working together within the scope and guidelines of business of the business goals. Where is the business going? How does the business make money? What does the business need to operate effectively? IT security will manage that to ensure that the systems, communications, and users are meeting or exceeding a, a level set of security or a goal of what our security should be. Security controls are logical, physical, and technical or legal uh, measures to control how we handle different events. We need to mitigate risk to ensure a level of security, and we will use controls to do that. So just as a parting thought here, and this is really what boils down to the challenge of security in general. As an adversary, gaining access to a network, if you're persistent enough, is simply a matter of time. You only need to be successful once to gain access to a network, to compromise it, to undermine its security, to uh, abuse it, steal its data, and ruin an organization's reputation. That's what you can do as an adversary. As a defender, we must be successful all of the time because that one time that an adversary gets in can be critical to our organization's success. And that right there presents the challenges of security.